thank you so much. Again, I am the director of the Down Syndrome Association of Middle Tennessee. I'm involved in this organization because I have a son, uh, Matthew, who has Down Syndrome, and Matthew is 16, and um, he has a sister, Katie, who's 12, and Katie's here with me. My goal in this organization is um, to make Tennessee a better place for our children with Down Syndrome. We began like a lot of our most support groups. Uh, we had three moms who sat at a kitchen table and wanted to uh, establish a network for families to share in the joys and challenges of raising our children with Down syndrome, and I happen to be one of those moms. Um, this is a picture of my children, Matthew and Katie. Our organization uh, started about 10 years ago with 65 families. And today we serve about 500 families. We just finished uh, strategic planning and um, based on the prior year's growth. In 2010, we expect to be working with about 710 families. Uh, our organization covers the Middle Tennessee area, which is about 47 counties. We do have four other support groups in Tennessee and we work very well with those groups. But because we're located in the middle of the state, um, we, they come to a lot of our meetings and our conferences and uh, the Down Syndrome Clinic. It, it's about a three hour travel uh, from the farthest point of the state to Nashville. Our mission is to enhance the lives of individuals with Down Syndrome throughout their lifespan. Uh, this is the mission we created 10 years ago and we still uh, strive to fulfill that mission every day. As you've heard here um, with the video and with Peter, we feel the uh, first contact and information that a new parent receives is very important. And we created the new parent booklet that Peter talked about. And they are placed in all of the uh, hospitals and some of the pediatricians, obstetricians office in Nashville and surrounding areas. It, the hospitals are very pleased to have this to hand to new parents. We have a good relationship with most of the hospitals and many times they will call us and ask us to come visit the new parents and we do that and we're very, we're very glad to do that. We also feel it's important for new parents to, to talk to other parents and, we, and have a place to talk about their fears and emotions that they first experience when their baby's born. So we have family group counseling where we have a therapist there to um, meet with the group and, and let, give them the opportunity to talk about what they're feeling and let them know that, that it's okay to feel those things and that we all did that. We, it's very important for uh, also as a parent to know and connect with another parent that might be just slightly ahead in the journey of raising our children with Down syndrome. And again, um, we created this Bright Beginnings book and it is in all of our hospitals. <coughs> Our organization started, again, uh, 10 years ago. We started with very little, and we worked very hard to meet the needs of the families. I'm just going to briefly run through some of the programs that we have available in Nashville that we've created for our families. Um, our babies are entered into early intervention programs at birth, and from early intervention, they are transitioned into the public school system at the age of three and they stay in the public school system until the age of 22. As you can imagine, these transitions, as these transitions occur, many families have difficulty in knowing their rights and what they can ask for for their child. So we have a part-time educational advocate that works strictly with the families on the educational issues. She attends the uh, meetings at the school or consults by phone, anything that the families need pertaining to their education needs. We hold many workshops throughout the year. This is just a, a list of some that uh, we've recently had or are coming up in 2006. These are usually small group uh, discussions, but occasionally a topic will interest many across the state and we'll have people traveling from all over to come. We began at the very bottom, you will see, um, we work with the areas in the state on the adult services. We try to make sure we're up to date on all those services and we can share that with our families. We started SIB shops, uh, sibling workshops for siblings. We have a quarterly newsletter that, we, that keeps all of our local families connected. We also send a weekly e-news called The Scoop. 
and our newsletter will list the local and national events. It also talks about the research going on in the country or any research that's currently taking place in Nashville. We recently added a WhatsApp doc and uh, families email us questions that they might um, just need an answer for that they or their pediatrician can't answer or whatever and we send those questions to the Down syndrome clinic and then they published a we published a question and the answer in our newsletter. Every other year we hold a statewide conference and again we are in the middle of the state so travel is very convenient to our conferences and also from the surrounding states people attend the conference. We have the speakers coming from all over the, across the United States uh, to speak. We've had, of course, Dr. Vandervoort speaks. Uh, George Capone has been to Nashville. So we try to uh, make sure we include a lot of good speakers that our families are familiar with. We started, um, well, as the organization grew, families began to let us know their needs. And one of those was an, uh, activities for our young adults. Uh, we were concerned about the regression that our kids were experiencing during the summer months and the lack of activities and friendships that they had. So we began the summer camps. The Summer Learning Academy started with 12 campers, and I think last summer we had 25 campers. Uh, from that, that camp is from age 12 to 22. We're also adding a Summer Learning Academy this year for the 8 to 12-year-olds. We have My Life, My Choice, My Plan, which is a two-week camp teaching self-advocate skills. That camp was held in a Williamson County, which is not the county that's in Nashville. And that was so successful that we're adding that camp uh, to Nashville, which is going to be called the transition camp. Many of these programs grow very quickly and very hard for us to manage, so it's important for us to work with other agencies and in the community to help us do this. There's just no way we could do it by ourselves. We have a monthly social program for our, our folks ages 12 and over. Again, we're very concerned about the lack of opportunities for our kids to make friends and be a part of everyday life. So we created a monthly social program again, and, and this is just a, a list of some of the things that they do at those at the circle of friends. And this is a picture of them doing uh, yoga. We started another group, this is again for ages 12 and over, and the families who had younger kids were saying, well, you know, we, you need to do something for us too. So we started a Saturdays with Sarah, and they meet for a much shorter time frame, as you are, I'm sure you understand why. Um, and, and here in, in Nashville, Tennessee, songwriters and guitar players are plentiful. So we are never short of having someone come and play the guitar and sing to our kids. Uh, so music is always a big part of any of the programs that we have. But when we started 10 years ago, a lot of the families had small children. Well, those kids are grown up now. So it's important for us to address the, uh, the aging issues of our kids and the aging issues of our parents as well. Um, so we try to stay up to date on all the adult services and how Medicaid waiver can get services are provided through that. It's, it's kind of difficult because in our country, t things change quite often. In addition to all the programs, we have a lot of social events, and these are uh, the highlight of the year for many families, and they're attended you know, by, by several hundreds of people. We also have a Home of Your Own program. Uh, this home ownership for people with disabilities is a hard concept for us to realize, and our organization, organization had a great interest in providing home ownership for people with disabilities. And we had a strong committee who was really backing it. So we began a program called Home of Your Own. We are the contractors who construct the home. And then we have volunteer labor to complete it. And we provide the 0% mortgage and the low monthly payments. We started this because many of the adults with Down syndrome who were receiving services um, were being transferred from home to home when the rent rose. And, and we know transition is very difficult for our adults. So we wanted to do something to try to uh, protect them in that way. And so these adults live in these homes with their services. That could be 24-7, or it could just be someone coming in to check on them periodically. But the services come to their home, and they can live in that home for as long as possible. Our organization it provides support and programs to meet the needs of the individuals with Down syndrome and their parents. 
As we became a larger support organization, we also became the contact for many health care issues. I'm the director of the association. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. But we were having calls from families from all over our Middle Tennessee area and the, the, uh, across the state. Families asking us, you know, can you, who's a pediatrician in my area that's familiar with Down syndrome? Or out in some of the rural areas, the pediatricians had very little knowledge of what to be looking for with Down syndrome. And so we really had some concerns about all of that. Um, I went over and met with the medical director at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Someone told me we had a new med director and um, it was my opportunity to introduce myself and w went over there and I talked to him and expressed the concerns that we had about the lack of good medical care for our children with Down syndrome. Um, he was very kind and he said, why don't you just go survey your families and find out what the medical needs are. So we did that and we took the, med we took the surveys back over to the hospital and they reviewed those with us and then they developed the, the Down syndrome clinic and it opened June 18th in 2001. They keep us very involved in what's going on at the clinic. They're always willing to hear what the parents think um, their services are and we're very happy to do that. They, um, as you know, parents can be very vocal and it's, it's nice to know that we can call and, and talk to them about some of the issues. Dr. Vandervoort, Vandervoort is here and he is the uh, pediatrician with that and we just can't say enough about what the Down Syndrome Clinic has done for the health care for our kids. We know we have better, uh, the kids are healthier and when you have healthy kids, uh, there's, education is a lot easier for them, uh, inclusion in the school systems are a lot, it's a lot easier for them. So we know what a Down Syndrome Clinic has done for our state. So that leads me into uh, Romney. Good morning. I want to thank you all for having us, um, the Down Syndrome Research Foundation of uh, UK, for having us here today. Um, again, my name is Romney Snyder-Croft. I'm an LCSW, which is a licensed clinical social worker, and I have been practicing since the uh, late 1980s, which kind of, I guess, starts to date me a little bit, with kids with um, developmental and behavioral issues. Um, my first experience with Down syndrome kids was actually um, in 1984 when I was doing um, some private work for a family while in graduate school. Uh, I am a mother of three. Alexander is age 12, Zachary is age 10, and Nathaniel is age six and a half. Zachary, our middle son, also has Down syndrome. Um, and even though I thought I would work with children with developmental disabilities um, and behavioral issues, I did not anticipate ever to bring a child home with him. Um, so to our surprise, uh, in 1996, Zachary was born. Um, at which point in time, I thought I would be pretty much in retirement um, because I knew from my past uh, work experience that uh, taking care of a child with special needs was going to be a full-time job. Uh, we relocated to the Nashville area in the spring of 2001, and at which point in time I had touched base with Sheila, um, and I guess, I guess this is another way that Sheila and the Down Syndrome Association plant another seed. And looking for a soccer opportunity for Zachary, I ended up uh, landing a full-time job at the clinic um, and have been very, very happy and pleased to be part of this program. Um, by the time I had gotten to the clinic, they had already had preliminary meetings. Um, Dr. Strauss and the, and the committee had met. Uh, they looked at feasibility and what needed to be done. Sheila had already surveyed our community in the Nashville area. And so uh, at that point in time, uh, prior to my hire, it was, um, they had already made the determination that we were gonna go ahead and do this. Uh, Dr. Vandervoort uh, was identified as the medical director at that time. Um, and prior to my coming, they had kind of a small cl clinic run through to kind of see how the dynamics would work. Um, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today um, are Down syndrome clinics being a tool for primary caregivers and the family for it to provide preventive care, the background of the Vanderbilt University Children's Hospital Down syndrome clinic, the relationships, the community supports, and the research. 
Down syndrome clinics uh, are really to be a, a tool for both families and the primary care physicians. Many of the primary care physicians do provide um, good general care for kids, uh, even children with Down syndrome. However, they don't necessarily look at the specific Down syndrome um, health issues and keep up with trends. And this would also be very similar to kids that have spina bifida and autism. And they wouldn't be quite as um, up on all the new research on all the different developmental issues, on all the different genetic uh, disabilities that are out there. If I think about Zachary being the age of 10, uh, would be a good example. The trends have changed several times over, and even though our PCP is a wonder, our primary care physician is a wonderful doctor, um, he kind of looks to the specialist to be able to kind of help keep him in the loop on what needs to be done. Down syndrome clinic models, um, when the committee started to meet, they also looked at the other models that were done in the United States. And um, to gather data on what we were going to start to evolve to look like. And there's approximately 57 Down syndrome clinics in the United States. Um, not all have pediatric care and adult care. Some are adult care only, some are pediatric. Um, some kind of route, the, when the children become adults, route them into uh, different types of, of programs. Um, some, it just kind of drops off. Some of the pediatric clinics continue to provide adult care, even in the pediatric clinic. Um, some are just medically consultative only, and they don't have the other developmental pieces to it. Um, and then there are some that are done in genetics clinics. And one of the things that our family said um, about that is they'd have been going to, I guess, what we would have considered a, a Down syndrome clinic before in genetics, that they love the genetics doctors, but they wanted to hear more than their child had trisomy 21. Um, and kind of looking at what's happening else around the world, Canada has approximately three Down syndrome clinics, South America has two, Japan has one, Africa has one, Southern Asia has two Down syndrome, Middle East has one Down syndrome clinic. Australia um, supposedly has one, and Europe has four, one in France, Netherlands, Slovakia, uh, Spain, and then Sweden. Five, sorry, I can't count either. <laughs> so that's what happens when you have three kids. Um, the Down Center Committee, uh, when they explored the feasibility of the program and after the need was done, they started developing short and long-term goals. The goals, um, which is kind of a philosophy within the clinic is we need to make sure that we make a difference. Um, we also need to be family centered, which is also the philosophy of the hospital. Uh, we do this by doing um, community and patient evaluations within the Down syndrome uh, community. We have a Down syndrome medical advisory board. We do local communication with the local associations, not only the Down syndrome associations, uh, but the Autistic Society in the Middle Tennessee area. Uh, the celiac support group, um, and even some of the other places where we can get resources for the families. We're very um, cognizant of the HIPAA laws, uh, which uh, kind of dictates who we can talk to and who we can't. Uh, it's a federal law in the United States. With release of individuals, we can um, call some of the charities to see if we can get beds for a family or call the Down Syndrome Association and say somebody is losing their housing. What, what can we do to make sure that we uh, can continue to meet these needs. Also, through the Down syndrome clinic, we've also been able to identify trends um, where maybe uh, families with new uh, born infants were saying, we'd really like to get together with um, some other families. You know, is there a support group where we can kind of talk about that? And uh, with working with Sheila, we've been able to get babies, 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 which is kind of a every other month type of support meeting that she had indicated. Um, where the parents can kind of come together and the babies crawl all over the place and the speaker comes in. And so they get some informative information, maybe about occupational therapy or physical therapy, um, but they may also be able to network between each other. And they get to see um, other families also. And that this has been a real effective tool for the families, uh, for the younger children. We also needed to be cost effective. And when you look at a developmental clinic, um, those were one of the big concerns that our hospital had um, because we need to make sure that we're cost effective looking at insurances. In the United States, we have two um, payment programs. We have a social program, which is kind of considered Medicaid and Medicare, uh, which our taxes pay for. And we have a private sector. And then 
the children, depending on what their income, may be eligible for these social programs, um, but if their parents work, they may still have private, and so there may be an overlap. And so when you're looking at um, being cost effective, we need to make sure that we didn't duplicate services. We need to, to, again, make sure that these were making a difference from everything else that they were getting. Uh, we needed to make sure that families were not stuck with a large bill seeing multiple providers. Um, and that the medical center wasn't stuck with a large bill also, um, because the medical center doesn't like to be stuck with big bills either and have to eat cost. Um, again, the goals, the medical team would follow both the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for Down syndrome as well as the Down syndrome medical interest group uh, of North America, uh, which we call DISMIG. Um, the goals were to have parent feedback to drive the clinic on the needs of their children and to have a board that consisted of both medical professionals as well as um, family members. And we meet once a quarter uh, to kind of talk about where we're going, um, some new ideas, if there's any research ideas. Um, sometimes we'll bring speakers in. If we've had any changes within the clinic, that's the time for us to kind of uh, discuss that with the community and with the board. Um, we also wanted to have a one-stop health care uh, that could be customized. Um, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit to talk about how we kind of do that. Families could also um, access multiple service and providers during their visits. And this is how we would customize this for each child. Uh, in the beginning, our team was very small. Um, this is Dr. Strauss. He's one of our cardiologists. He's also the uh, director of Children's Hospital. We had a developmental pediatrician, which is Dr. Vandervoort. We had a genetic counselor. Uh, I were also the role of social worker within the clinic, uh, as well as many other roles. Uh, and we had a representative from the Kennedy Center, and the Kennedy Center is a research um, center that is across the street that provides many research opportunities for families. And so they would come over and share with the families what types of services were available. Um, parent evaluations. For the first several years, a simple evaluation was given to the families to provide um, feedback uh, to the clinic so we knew what to, um, how to improve things, if we were on the right track, if things needed to be changed. Um, through the feedback, more comprehensive care uh, was be able to be developed. We were able to include physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and feeding therapists, nutritionists, and we even were able to get volunteer to help us out with the toys. Um, this is the initial feedback, and this is kind of how we got all those other team members, is that um, parents uh, said that workshops and sen uh, seminars regarding medical needs, regarding individuals with Down syndrome were needed. Uh, it would have been helpful to see other doctors scheduled that my child needed to see, like neurologists, gastroenterologists, and pulmonologists. Uh, PT, OT, and speech were not available through the clinic, and we were hoping to see other developmental opinions to some of the developmental issues our child is having. Um, and so we added uh, more folks, and we've actually added a couple more. We have a fellow and another developmental pediatrician. We have a couple new faces, um, but this is what uh, we kind of evolved to. Developmental pediatrician, um, and a currently we have two, and a developmental fellow. We have two pediatric cardiologists. Uh, we have a genetic counselor. We have the medical center, and, and I know that's kind of a broad way to kind of take a look at that, but we can customize things through the medical center. We have a psychologist, uh, physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech and feeding, nutrition, social work, and a representative from the Kennedy Center. Um, also, as uh, it was identified through the, the Down syndrome clinic that a adult Down syndrome clinic was going to be needed, and approximately a year and a half ago, uh, we started up a very small consultative, um, medically consultative adult clinic, and this is Dr. Garrison. He's our medical director for adult clinic. Um, the referral process, the initial referral process through the clinic uh, coordinator uh, that individual triages the family's needs. So this telephone call can take almost up to an hour sometimes in some cases between getting insurances, what the family needs. Sometimes the families don't know what they need. They just said, I hear we need to call you. And so you kind of have to go through kind of that, the DISMIG recommendations, what's been done, what are your needs, what are your concerns, um, where have you been, and so that's kind of what the coordinator kind of triages in the front. We always need to make sure that we get a, a referral from the p primary care physician. We need that not only for monetary reasons, but we also need to make sure that 
um, that that relationship with the primary care physician is, is in place and that we're actually working as a tool for the primary care physician. Some of the primary care physicians also want us to uh, draw blood and things like that because as some of the kids get older, it's a lot easier for our um, phlebotomists to do that than it is for maybe just their nurse at their clinic. Uh, appointments are customized uh, and are made per the, the primary care physician's recommendations and the family needs and any patient education materials are prepared in advance if a family identifies the needs. So we'll have a lot of families that will come in and say, we've hit puberty and we, and we need to read something and we need to read it fast and we'll have a packet ready and then the psychologist will talk to um, the family and Dr. Vanderbilt will share some information possibly regarding birth control and some other options that the family has uh, if that's desired. Um, clinic visits, the visits uh, are associated with other medical services throughout the medical center. So when they're seeing cardiology on that day, they're getting an echo if they need it. Um, you know, if they need an x-ray uh, for um, cervical uh, stability, uh, they'll get that on the day and this is one of our new fancy giraffe x-ray machines. Um, the clinic begins at check-in and uh, we try to be incredibly family focused even from this point and through the waiting areas and even into the rooms. The Down Syndrome patients um, for a Thursday Down Syndrome clinic which is kind of our comprehensive clinic, uh, Jane Doe is a, a pretend patient so that we're not violating anybody's uh, HIPAA privacy here. But here we would have pediatric cardiology, developmental, pediatrician, genetic psych, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and feeding, nutrition, social work, audiology, the Kennedy Center, and anybody else that they would need to see. I think our record holder is about 14 to 15 visits over two days. And because some of our families um, travel so far, uh, sometimes they need to get it all in. They may not see all these folks, um, all these providers. Um, but sometimes someone, some of the new patients will come in to kind of get a baseline of us and for us to get a baseline of, of them. And so we may possibly see, uh, they may see this many providers. In a full day clinic, uh, we may have seven to eight uh, patients and we kind of make a grid like this so we can keep track of ourselves, but it would not be an unusual day to see 40, approximately 48 um, different providers and five to 10 ancillaries. Uh, during the day. And again, we would have new patients or return patients um, come and they may say a, a bunch of different folks during that day. Uh, the parent feedback, um, after we became more comprehensive, the feedback was the clinic was very informative. This is our first visit here, so there's nothing I can really say to improve here, um, to improve services. Everyone was very helpful and I'm glad that the clinic is now available. I could get more ideas and second opinions as well seems to be a good adjunct to, what, to all that we are already doing. Everybody seemed very knowledgeable about Down issues in particular. Um, it was nice to see so much done in just one visit. There, uh, there was a very little wait between procedures or doctors, which was great. We must have been having a good day. Um, thank you so much for opening the clinic and providing the special services for our special population. Uh, community support. Community uh, supports are identified within the community and referrals are made. Um, usually the social worker does part of that, but the other team members may say uh, after consulting uh, with the child that um, this child needs to be plugged into their area with an occupational therapist. And again, if the kids are traveling two hours away, they're not going to come in and see someone in Nashville. So we need to try to plug them back into their community and try to get those resources um, set up for them. Um, they may be developmental services, they may need more medical programs uh, or to see other specialists afterwards and so part of that is um, something that's coordinated through the clinic. Relationships, since Down syndrome is a lifelong chronic disease process, the families use the clinic to continue to monitor their child's progress both medically, developmentally and as a support system. Um, we have many families that will also call and, and say, you know, just to use us as um, information also. You know, where do I go from here? I just saw Dr. Vandervoort last week. Um, he mentioned something about the, something about um, there's this service in town. How do I get a hold of that? And so they kind of, um, because we have that relationship with families over time, uh, they know that they can kind of call and pick our brains. 
research, families have identified early on that they were in hopes that we would participate in research and we continue um, to get family feedback regarding the desire of Vanderbilt University Children's Hospital as well as the larger medical center to participate in research in the future. And this is Dr. Strauss down in his lab uh, with a research assistant and these are just references. And this is kind of what, this is Zachary um, and obviously we found our soccer game as well. Um, he's taking a break, but he's the one that kind of keeps us driven. Thank you. Any occupational therapy, physical therapist, allied health workers, social workers? There's one over there with a camera. Any Episcopal priests in the audience? Oh, that's my wife. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, what I want to uh, talk with you about today is what we're doing uh, in Nashville to um, help families and their children with Down syndrome. Now, a little bit about who I am. I'm a general pediatrician by background, and uh, by work experience, uh, I'm a developmental pediatrician. Uh, I have not been in, in academics my entire career. I actually started in private practice. My wife wanted to go to graduate school. We moved to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and I got my first job with Vanderbilt. Um, spent some time at the University of Arizona, spent some time with the Child Development Center in Fort Worth, Texas, and then was invited back to Vanderbilt to uh, work with the pediatricians, the pediatric residents, and to teach them how to prepare for and function in private practice. And because of my experience with developmental pediatricians, uh, as a developmental pediatrician, to uh, help them get a better understanding of uh, developmental pediatrics. We were thrilled to be able to go back to Vanderbilt. One of my friends there said the only reason we were able to return was that all the arrest warrants had expired. Nonetheless, uh, we, we came back. Um, as I said, the thing that I do most is work with uh, the residents and prepare them for private practice. And uh, looking back at my career, I'm going to my 40th uh, anniversary as a physician uh, in uh, this next month. But I've spent over 18 years in private practice. So I, I have, I think, maintained a good perspective of what it's like to be a practicing physician and not just uh, an academician. To give you some, some background, because our healthcare systems may be different, and I say may be different because I don't know for sure how your healthcare system works. We all hear stories. You hear stories about how ours works. And so I just want to review with you a little bit about that. that Clearly, in, in uh, the United States, we basically have a private uh, medicine system where people have health insurance. Uh, for, especially for children who do not have the financial resources, uh, there is a program called Medicaid, and it varies in various states how it's administered. The federal government gives the money to the state. And in Tennessee, there's a program called TenCare, uh, and it is supposed to be a safety net uh, to provide care for uh, all the children. The, the belief is that all of these patients, children and adults, should have uh, a primary care physician. And that's my main job, is to prepare our pediatric residents to be that primary care physician. Uh, they should obviously give the preventive care that we're all expecting uh, and, and really should be the person who's most in charge of the child's health care. For those of us that may function also as specialists or that are that entirely, we see patients generally on a referral only basis uh, from these children, from their physicians. So. Coordination by the PCP is warranted uh, to ensure uh, that they get proper care. Uh, insurance companies will often not pay for care uh, unless the, it, there has been a referral. And um, 
it's the job then of the specialist to give information back to uh, the primary care physician. Uh, I think we're all uh, very familiar with what routine well care is, and this is what we expect our PCPs to do. And as Romney said earlier in answer to one of your questions, we in the Down Syndrome Clinic are not there to provide primary health care. We're there to provide a special interest care, a specialty care, not primary care. And that's why appointments through the Down Syndrome Clinic uh, are by referral only. Obviously, well child care involves immunizations, monitoring growth on growth charts, monitoring of development, and when indicated, early intervention. And it's the primary care physician that should be referring children for early intervention services, um, and that's not the Down Syndrome Clinic. In Tennessee, there's the Tennessee Early Intervention Services, or TEIS as they're referred to, and they're responsible for children with developmental problems known or perceived to be at risk up for the first three years, and then the care switches to school, even if they're not uh, involved uh, in school at that point, which of course they aren't as a general rule. Uh, this is a, a picture of Vanderbilt Children's Hospital, which was opened uh, just two years ago. Uh, this is the, uh, the grand staircase. Uh, this hospital was built primarily by donations from the community. And so although Vanderbilt itself is a freestanding, not-for-profit, fee-for-service institution, it is not a state or federal government institution. The Children's Hospital actually began in 1968, and at that time was perceived as a hospital within a hospital. Uh, we had a certain part of the General Vanderbilt Hospital that was the pediatric hospital. Obviously, to provide the highest quality of care to children, uh, and it's been family oriented. For example, in our neonatal intensive care units now, each room is a single room with room for the parents to stay. There are a couple of rooms for twins, and there's even one room for triplets. Now, we are very fortunate at Vanderbilt, in spite of being a private institution, to really be the most comprehensive children's hospital uh, in the state. And as I said, we, we did open the new hospital uh, in two years ago. And as I said, we are a not-for-profit but fee-for-service hospital with active patient care, teaching, and research. And the teaching, we have over 700 residents in the Vanderbilt community. Uh, 100 uh, are pediatric residents and fellows. So we have a very large training program, and a, a lot of our residents end up staying in the Nashville community in private practice. A certain percentage of them stay in academics, some at Vanderbilt, and uh, some go uh, other places. The outpatient department saw almost 122,000 visits in 05. We have 32 subspecialists within pediatrics alone, and we've got about 130 faculty in general uh, in the pediatric department. All of those folks are really available to us. We have 216 inpatient beds, 36 intensive care beds for older children, 72 neonatal beds. We really don't have 25 emergency rooms. We have an emergency room with 25 uh, beds in it, plus three beds for triage and ten uh, for observation. That would be somebody who may stay just for 24 hours uh, before being discharged. Unfortunately, we've been so full lately that um, uh, the observation has gone on and on and on. We have 14 operating rooms. Um, we have a comprehensive cancer treatment center, and uh, we also have a transplant center. Uh, so we're different from the other hospitals in that we provide, in the state of Tennessee, the most comprehensive medical care of any of the hospitals, and our patients, 
from the Down Syndrome Clinic have been in every one of those facilities used except for transplant. So when we started a Down Syndrome Clinic, the effect on the hospital was much larger than just patients coming to the clinic. It has been a big influence at the hospital. Well now, in order to do this well, one needs to be able to communicate. And fortunately, about two and a half years ago, uh, we began uh, an electronic record. Uh, this has really been absolutely incredible, uh, although difficult at times. Uh, but it has been an incredible resource for us because we are now able to see without any problem at all, whenever we see a patient, where they've been within the system, who saw them, what was done. I can get an email from somebody, say an ENT, and they'll say we saw patient so-and-so. I can go to the what's called star panel and look that up and right away have uh, uh, their note right there, which I can then print off if I want to. Can look at lab work, all sorts of things. This is our typical examining room. The, the computer is on wheels, and so we can turn it around, and I frequently use that to, for example, show the families the growth curves, how the child is growing. And what I often do is first show the standard growth curve and then switch it to the down mode, the down syndrome mode, and show where they are. So I can show on the standard growth curve that the child's height is below the third percentile, but then when we go to the down syndrome mode, we may see that the child's actually at the 50th percentile. If they say, you know, we saw the endocrinologist last week, but I don't remember whether or not he draw, drew the thyroid studies, it, it's right there and then I have it available to be able to review uh, with the family. The other thing that this really allows us to do is to collect information on our patients uh, so that it's sort of a, a, an ongoing project to evaluate uh, children um, and to keep track of what we're finding. For example, celiac disease, as you know, occurs at an increased frequency in children with Down syndrome and the textbooks have listed that at about a 5% rate. Well, we found that it's anywhere from uh, 7 to 10%. Uh, that's not necessarily a big change, but it reflects the, something that we are able uh, to follow along. And we found that as many as 44% of the children that we've seen uh, have hypothyroidism. Allantoaxial instability has been present in, you know, I pronounce that word several times a day just so that I don't slip on it. Uh, Atlantoaxial instability in about 16% of our clinic patients. Again, higher than what we see. We got a phone call from one of our pediatric surgeons a while back and he, he really wanted to start studying our population and we've talked to Sheila about trying to survey uh, our families because he was reviewing uh, children that he had recently operated on for Hirschsprung's disease, and five out of the nine cases that he had most recently done were children with Down syndrome, which is much different than what would, one would expect. So the medical record has facilitated our ability to take care of these children. We can take material sent in by the PCP and scan it into the record so that it's available in the record. And of course, then it makes it very simple to uh, produce a report for the PCP uh, so that they know what we've done and what we've recommended because they are the people who are managing the patients. Uh, we're trying to give them some advice on how things to, uh, should be done from our perspective. Well, how did this all start? You've heard a little bit about that already. Uh, Sheila met with uh, Dr. Strauss, they got some data together and uh, it was decided that we would have a clinic and we had our opening clinic in June of uh, 2001. Uh, and that was really sort of a trial. Sheila's son came 
And uh, uh, we, we checked him out and uh, a few other uh, happy families that uh, let us participate. But the amazing thing was that, that, you know, we said, well, one half day a month will be fine. Uh, and yet by September, just three months later, and actually I had taken August off, so it was only uh, June and July, we realized that we needed to expand the clinic and we were doing three clinics a month and the fourth was a medical management and now we've had to bump the medical management and we are having a clinic, a full clinic every Thursday morning uh, and on some Wednesdays I also see other patients uh, that are just need to see the physician. Now that may be a patient who is going to be seen by the whole group but there's some medical issues that we're concerned about and so we want them to be seen right away. It may be that they're just a follow-up with me, <coughs> excuse me, after having uh, been through the whole clinic. Some of them uh, may be uh, patients that are having behavioral issues and I may meet with them. I may also meet with a psycho uh, psychologist at that time. We expanded the clinic. It was found, obviously, as again uh, Romney pointed out earlier, that we really needed the facilities of uh, the allied health care workers, PT, OT, speech, nutrition, genetic uh, is, genetics is involved. We had one of their workers uh, attends the clinic and meets with families that have questions in regard to that. But again, we tailor it as best we can to the needs that the families have identified to us as to what they need. Uh, obviously, if the child comes in for a first visit and we know that they've had an echo and do not have any congenital heart disease, then they have no need to see the cardiologist. Now, some of the issues that are addressed in the clinic, uh, but also addressed by their PCP, are things such as the newborn screen, we now screen for about 80 different inborn errors of metabolism, having expanded in the last two years from the five pretty standard things that we screened for, which were uh, thyroid disorders, uh, hemoglobinopathies, uh, phenylketonuria, uh, and two others that I can't immediately think of, but we're now up to uh, about 80. We feel like all children with uh, Down syndrome, as was mentioned in the DVD, should have an echocardiogram uh, done immediately, regardless of uh, what the physical findings are. I was attending in the nursery uh, two or three years ago. We had a baby born with Down syndrome. Uh, did not have a murmur, but I just didn't want, uh, uh, like the way the baby looked, and I asked to transfer the baby into the intensive care unit. The baby had been in the unit for about a half an hour when it went uh, into shock. Turned out it had a ductal dependent lesion uh, which started to close. We were able to uh, fortunately uh, do well with that child uh, primarily because we'd already gotten the baby in the intensive care uh, unit. Obviously we need to observe for the well-known gastrointestinal problems, uh, the duodenal atresia and Hirschsprungs being some of the more commonly. Uh, seen ones, we have, uh, I think, five uh, pediatric surgeons on staff, so we certainly have good uh, backup uh, there. Thyroid uh, is one of the things that is studied or looked at in the uh, initial newborn screen, uh, and according to the standard recommendations of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Down Syndrome Association, we uh, routinely screen for that at six months of age and then yearly. Uh, unless there are uh, problems. Uh, we feel that uh, obviously they should have uh, eye, hearing, and uh, ear uh, management. Uh, at birth, we all, at Vanderbilt anyway, they all get uh, ABR testing uh, to make sure their hearing is normal. All babies do that, not just children with Down syndrome. Um, but we do want the ophthalmologist and the audiologist involved in their early care. At some point, the ophthalmologist frequently tells us that they do not need to see the child any longer, but we still want them to have yearly vision testing uh, to make sure that that's not a problem. Celiac screening, we generally do that at about two years of age, but two to three years of age, uh, obviously even if they're not symptomatic, 
some people do recommend that it be repeated later on, uh, as is indicated uh, here on this slide. Atlantoaxial instability, uh, we generally do that at three. Sometimes if they're having surgery, it'll be done at an earlier age. And again, I think that this is still somewhat uh, controversial as to whether or not it should be repeated later on. Uh, we have a problem in um, the states with Special Olympics. Well, they will not allow children to participate unless they have had a recent uh, C-spine. And uh, there's also another group that does hippotherapy uh, that's uh, requiring the same thing. Obviously, these children are at increased risk for seizures. Apnea is a, a big problem, sleep apnea. I, I got scared really uh, badly. I walked into a room and there was a 15-year-old boy sitting with his head on his mother's shoulder, sort of asleep. He was, I mean, I, what's blue? He was as blue as I've seen. And this kid had absolutely incredible sleep apnea sitting there uh, in the examining room with his mother. Well, I immediately uh, moved him over into one of our acute care clinics uh, and got him some supplemental oxygen and subsequently got an evaluation of his sleep status. Uh, he had a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy and then was put on CPAP at night. And when I saw him the next time, I couldn't believe it. He was awake, alert. Uh, he had decided that uh, he liked going to school and was up every morning on his own to get ready to go to school. Uh, it was absolutely incredible transformation in that uh, young man. Obesity is a, a big problem for these kids and I think that the main problem with, you know, the, the problem with obesity in, in anybody is, is too many calories and too little activity for the amount of calories consumed and whether that's me or these children. And, and what happens is, in, in our experience, is that feeding is such a nice thing, and it makes people happy, that that's an easy way to try and help with the child's behavior. And if the child has turned into a couch potato, you still give them all this food, even though they're not burning it up. So obesity is a real serious problem, as you all know, for these kids. But on the other hand, in the newborn period, as was indicated also on in the DVD, feeding problems are very significant. And uh, the, the poor suck, uh, the inability to um, really swallow well successfully, often with aspiration, we've ended up with a lot of uh, kids on uh, NG tubes uh, for the short term, and some of them even have required uh, a Mickey button, a G tube, uh, for longer term care to get them through the first several months. Obviously, if it's just a matter of a couple of months, we would try and uh, stick with um, an NG tube or maybe an NJ tube uh, if they're having a lot of reflux. Alzheimer's disease, we're certainly concerned about that and uh, our, we have a developmental fellow this year who is sort of an interesting uh, person. She uh, had been in private practice and is a board certified pediatrician had been in practice for 13 years and decided she wanted to come back uh, and do a fellowship in developmental pediatrics and concentrate uh, on Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. Partly that's, I think, because she now has a 15-year-old daughter with Down syndrome and I think she's uh, afraid of what's going to happen down the road, but it's great to have her there and have that interest um, going for us. The behavior spectrums in children with Down syndrome uh, is, is really very problematic for us. Uh, some of the behaviors are simply due to the fact that they have great difficulty with language and are not able to uh, communicate well and they get very frustrated uh, from that. We see a lot of problems with mismanagement. I point out to families that all of us tend to have a, a bad habit or two. But did any of us at any point say, I'm going to develop a bad habit intentionally? But bad behavior management develops in the same way. Simple mistakes that are made 
uh, not recognizing that what they're doing to discipline the child is actually perceived as a reward. And so we see lots of problems. It, it's not uncommon a child will be misbehaving in the examining room and the family will say to the child, don't you do that again. And then the child does it again and they say, don't you do that again. One family told the child, not to run out of the room, not to open the door and walk out of the room or they would spank his butt. He opened the door, looked at his mother and walked out of the room and his mother turned to me and said, what should I do? <laughs> well, you'd already declared yourself. <laughs> so we, we, see, we see a lot of mismanagement and again, it, it, just, it just evolves. Uh, these kids do have ADHD, a lot of them. Autism is a growing problem in terms of recognition because a lot of these children with, with autism in our experience develop it a little atypically, a little later. But they have the same sort of problems with language, with behaviors, and with uh, inability to relate to uh, other people. Obsessive compulsive qualities versus obsessive compulsive disorder. We certainly see that. Depression, uh, regressed development. One of the things that we've been seeing in our teenage kids is a growing recognition on their part that they are not like other children. We believe in inclusive education, but there comes a time in the classroom when the child is 14 or 15 and they're working on a coloring book and everybody else is working on world history or politics or something, they begin to really understand that there may be a difference. And that has caused some children that we've seen to have fairly significant depression. Depression in general, if a child is not particularly nonverbal, how do you know if they're not hallucinating? We think we've seen some uh, children with uh, schizophrenia. Of course, we have motor and tick problems. Ticks are real common and uh, the, uh, some of them, uh, we had one youngster who um, was having ticks to the extent that it was really disrupting the classroom and teachers were concerned. And what he would do is he would sort of have a head jerk like this, but when he did that, he'd then throw his hands up. Now at home, all he ever did was that. There was never the hands. And so I suggested that this was the, hand, was the attention getting device. And that if the school would ignore that, that it, that behavior would extinguish. Not this, but the whole thing. Now, maybe it was a complex tick. I don't think so. Because when the school chose to ignore it, not call his mother and have him taken home, this went away. Even on psychostimulant medication to improve his attention span. Motivation can be a problem with some of these uh, youngsters, I uh, knew a young man who uh, unfortunately stepped in front of an automobile and he broke uh, both his legs. He uh, was put into an extensive rehab program which he just could not motivate himself to do. He did not understand, it hurt, he didn't want to do it. Uh, when I last saw him he uh, was on crutches and they were feeling he would probably never get off them, whereas if he had gone with the program he could have been uh, off of those. So we see some problems there. Some of the other difficulties we have is that the, the patients themselves have difficulty telling us what's going on with them. And, and an older uh, child who comes in and uh, says that they're having chest pain. This one 14-year-old uh, girl said she was having chest pain. The family was concerned that she had heart disease. I really think she was having reflux and we put her on anti-reflux medication and her chest pain went away. But she couldn't say anything other than to tap her chest. 
and her family thought that that was what was going on there. So oh, this obviously is a problem when you're trying to get a history specifically uh, from the, the patient themselves. Now the individuals with Down syndrome obviously can have uh, any variety of health issues just like anybody else. Uh, and as is always the case, no two individuals are exactly the same in terms of their health care issues. Well, so we put together a team to try and address the issues that we thought we'd be seeing. We started with a developmental pediatrician, and I was appointed to, to do that and was very excited about getting it going. Dr. Strauss was our initial uh, pediatric cardiologist. We had genetics involved, and then uh, the medical center with an asterisk. Because Dr. Strauss was the head of the children's hospital, he was able to tell our colleagues that they would help us. And so we were able to get priority appointments in any of the other subspecialties. Not that our waiting lists are that long, but we were able to get somebody into endocrinology or gastroenterology or whatever. Now, actually, with endocrinology, if I, we found a child that was hypothyroid, I would usually start them on uh, Synthroid with a cons quick consultation with the endocrinologist and then set a follow-up visit uh, later on for them. So we had the facilities of the medical center, and that included radiology, uh, the phlebotomists, and everything. Psychology has been a very important part of our team. Uh, to help deal with the family's turmoil, their grief, their uh, psychosocial issues, and of course the same issues that may uh, be present in the child. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, obviously givens, especially in the younger children, speech and feeding problems. In, in our hospital, in our institution, uh, our speech pathologists are the one that usually are involved with uh, feeding. Uh, whereas I know in other places occupational therapy is uh, involved with that. We have a nutritionist, uh, a social worker, and then we have uh, some support from the Kennedy Center uh, where they're uh, able to uh, get these children into some uh, of their research projects. As a matter of fact, this is Dr. Steve Camerata who is a speech and behavioral specialist from the Kennedy Center and when we first started he was doing uh, some of our speech therapy uh, with us. Uh, this is just a picture of our uh, occupational and, and uh, uh, physical therapist, uh, Sarah and Karen here, Karen uh, Guruchari, our uh, physical therapist, and Sarah Wilson, occupational therapist. And the, the example here is, is that here's sort of a sub-team that worked together. They would go in and see the children uh, at the same time, but within our team we had several sub-teams. Uh, for example, if we have feeding issues, I would frequently be sub-teaming, so to speak, with our, spe our uh, speech person and with the nutritionist to work through a child's feeding problems. Uh, for behavioral issues, myself and Dr. Linda Ashford, our psychologist, might be uh, working together. So we tried to be very flexible in, in how to best work and evaluate uh, these children. This is uh, a picture, you saw this earlier, of our team. Uh, the players have changed somewhat. This is our, our nutritionist. Uh, this is a volunteer uh, in our clinic, our physical therapist, speech, genetics, nurse, occupational therapist. Let's see, who is that? Oh yeah, Romney. Uh, <laughs> Arnie Strauss, our boss, uh, myself, Linda Ashford, our psychologist, and Dr. Exil, uh, one of the other uh, cardiologists, either uh, Dr. Exil or Strauss uh, attend for cardiology in our clinic. Well, who comes to the clinic? We have seen uh, patients from nine different states, and I'll show you a map here in just a minute so that you can get an idea of uh, what that is. And, I think as somebody pointed out uh, earlier that uh, distance is a little bit different in the states than it is here. But we've seen children from uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Nebraska, and Alabama. And if you are at all familiar with the geography of the United States, you realize that the only outlier there really is Nebraska, which is quite a ways away, Missouri also a little bit. 
So we've seen about 475 patients. There may be a few more that we have really sort of missed. But one of the interesting stories was uh, a family from Turkey. Uh, and he was a captain in the Turkish Air Force. And he was uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, which is a, uh, a rocket center, uh, one of NASA's big places. And they had a child with Down syndrome. And they came to the clinic to get their child evaluated. And they were so impressed with not only what we could do, but just the Nashville community and what was available, that he resigned from the Air Force. Uh, and they have moved uh, to Nashville, uh, where he does have a, a job. Uh, the one family that came from Nebraska, uh, one way, 1,600 kilometers. I'm from Nebraska originally, and that's not why they came. They didn't come to see me. They didn't know that. 20% uh, of our patients have come from Kentucky, which is the state just to the north. And we find that interesting because there are two different medical schools in uh, Kentucky, as well as a, an air base, I mean an army base that has a developmental pediatric program. Also, right across the river to the north of uh, Kentucky is uh, Cincinnati, and Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, is a very well-known institution. Uh, many of the families travel, as Romney indicated earlier, four to six hours uh, to get a full evaluation, and that may mean that they're there for a day or two, that we don't try and do everything uh, at once. That, that just is too much. Now, why did they come? Well, a third were sort of curious about what the clinic was all about, which, which really, I think, blended with the second third, which really wanted to make sure that they were staying current with what was going on with Down syndrome care in general. Uh, and then a third of them had health care issues. Now, in spite of the fact that there are standard guidelines available in many places telling physicians what they're supposed to do, many of these families came with those routine things not having been done. Uh, one family came in and said, well, we just heard this was a Down syndrome thing. It was actually sleep apnea. And what they meant by that was, well, that there wasn't anything to do about it. It was just part of being Down syndrome. How, a frequent question is, how bad do we have it? So we try and tell them, in general, supportive, what children with Down syndrome are like, that there are limitations, but that we want to do everything we can to let the child lead us to as far as they're going to be able to go. I don't see any differences. This one family said this, this child is developing quite normally. I have no concerns about his development. It is going to be normal. And I looked the parents in the eye and I said, no, it is not. We have to be realistic. Um, this was typical. Yes, we had his thyroid done when he's a baby, uh, but he's 15 now. Do we need to have that repeated? And this is somebody who was getting routine health care from a good physician. We also had a child from one of our outstanding groups in Nashville referred because of growth failure. And when we put the child's growth on the Down syndrome curve, there was no problem. But on the standard growth curves, the child didn't look so good. Well, some of you may recognize this as a, uh, a map of the United States. And our catchment area so far is about 440,000 square kilometers. Here's Nebraska. Here's Tennessee. And Nashville's right about there where that TN is. So that you can see that, that the states that we've drawn from are really, except for the Carolinas, uh, are really the border states and then the one uh, from Nebraska. And that compares to the UK, which is 242, uh, nine uh, square kilometers. So we have drawn from quite a large area. And yes, that's true of the United States in general. We are a big country. Well, that's part of our problems, too, I guess. 
So what's a day like at the clinic? I think you can read that, but to me, my job, to keep my head powdered so that they don't go blind. Um, I forgot that this morning. I met, should probably have a, did you bring my hat so I can put that on? Oh, you forgot it again, all right. This is sort of funny. This is one of our residents, uh, Betsy Bales, uh, who uh, actually grew up in uh, rural uh, Kentucky. She's now in private practice in uh, Nashville. This family was from rural Kentucky, and it turns out that this woman and Betsy's older sister were best of friends. And of course, she didn't know that. We opened the door to go in and see the child, and Betsy looked at it and said, oh, I know you. Uh, so happy coincidence. My job is to address the medical issues, but as I tell families, yes, I'm the pediatrician, but what I'm really interested in is anything you want to ask about. Now, when I'm the last one to come in, I frequently say, I know all your questions have been answered, but is there anything that I can answer? I'm here to do anything I can. We try and uh, coordinate uh, everything to evaluate their health, medical issues. This is very important. We have a resident in every clinic, uh, and often we have medical students. We also uh, have other health care professionals. Uh, there's a PT and OT. A student right now that's attending clinic and we frequently have speech people also. Um, so my job I think is is more than just the doctor but to kind of oversee that the whole clinic process uh, works well. Uh, so I see the patient and the family, I hear specific concerns and why they're here, do a physical, inquire on how the family is doing. Uh, one family that baby was uh, three weeks old and they were just crying the whole visit and you know you've had that experience you just you wanted somehow to be able to reach out and help them and and you knew there really wasn't anything they had a lot to work through and I finished with them and I walked into the next room and it was a one-year-old child and I said to the family how are you doing today and the dad looked up and said much better than last year and I thought oh gosh if I could just get you to go next door and help these people show them that there is uh, uh, a future. Um, so then we've got uh, prescriptions that may be done and whatever else needs to be done in the clinic. Um, but we have all these other folks to see them. Um, return appointments, if useful to the PCP and or family, I say that to every family. I'd like to see you back in the clinic whenever it is, if it will be helpful to you and to your doctor. If you don't need us because you're getting everything you need done, fine. We're happy and you don't need to come back and see us. And, and I think that gets back to what I said earlier, is that we are not trying to replace the PCP. But we want to make sure that everything is being done. And I will say this, that in spite of the level of care that they're getting, and, and it's generally always excellent, these families opt to come back. There's a, a comfort level in coming back uh, to see us. We do follow the recommendations of the American Pediatric, uh, actually it's the AAP, that's another one of those kind of things that we, we do that every once in a while, just see if people are aware and alert, you know. But AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, and uh, their website, by the way, is aap.org, uh, if you're not familiar with that. And then the uh, Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group. Uh, we have also developed within the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, some standard procedures. Uh, if we are invited by the attending, we will send some, somebody from our team down there uh, to meet with them. Uh, we also have a protocol in the uh, normal nursery. If a child with Down syndrome is born, 
to uh, make sure that the attending, especially if it's an attending who's uh, from the outside, uh, that, that they are aware of our services. And I might say that one of the strengths of Vanderbilt is that we have a wonderful relationship base with our community physicians. We are the hospital where they hospitalize their patients and where they come and attend on their patients. They come in to clinics uh, or to conferences, I should say. They do attend some at clinics. They co-attend on the wards. We have a great relationship with the PCPs. And part of that is because we don't take over the patient. Uh, this is the uh, standards of care for the adults, uh, which of course we still use because of the older uh, things, or <laughs> requirements for these children, uh, specifically the thyroid, uh, and, and the other things, the dental, the standard immunizations that we just review with them to make sure that they're doing. You saw Dr. Garris's picture earlier. We identified him as an assistant. I was really uncomfortable seeing uh, the 25 and 26 year olds uh, who were beginning to have some more of the adult uh, kind of problems. And so we wanted to uh, get uh, the adult. And he actually is a, a specialist in pediatrics and internal medicine or med peds. He's boarded in both internal medicine and pediatrics. Uh, our pediatric cardiologists continue to give uh, follow up there because uh, obviously the adults aren't as familiar with long-term outcome of congenital hearts. Well, we think that, that our clinic is, is going to be a, a, a great place to do some research because, as I said earlier, our medical uh, record, uh, I think, lends itself to uh, being able to track things. Uh, I think our patients uh, are getting a little better care. Uh, in certain areas, if, if nothing else, because we've helped the community be more aware of some of the problems. Uh, and we've already been talking about uh, creating a, a study group uh, within several institutions in the United States to try and uh, uh, increase our uh, work. So the final message. <laughs> I don't have a final message in regard to Down syndrome. There's a lot of work to be done. We have found uh, the Down syndrome clinic to be personally very satisfying. And we get feedback that tells us that our families have been very pleased. And we get feedback that our community physicians are very pleased with the help we've been giving them. We have not taken over the care of their patients. Um, so we try to deal with anticipatory guidance. Uh, Romney mentioned earlier some of the sex issues that come up. And uh, I asked one mother, what, what are you doing about sex? And she said, don't say that word. And then smiled and said, yes, I need help. It was like the 13-year-old sitting in his mother's lap. And he turned to her and was doing this to her chest. And she said, I don't understand why he does that. I said, maybe to figure out why your chest is different than dad's or his own? And this mother of the 17-year-old who wanted to know why when they went to the malls, her son went over to the mannequins and was pulling the skirts up. So I mean, there's just all sorts of issues that, that we can talk about in regard to that. Um, I think that being able to come to one place and get a multidisciplinary uh, evaluation and update on your child has been very, very helpful to these uh, folks. And I think that uh, with our team and with my particular interest and Dr. Ashford's interest, the psychologist, that we're able to benefit uh, some of the emotional issues of the whole family. It obviously is providing a medical uh, basis uh, for our residents and, and medical students so that they will go out into the community and know more about Down syndrome and be better prepared to be good primary care physicians for uh, these um, uh, patients. And if we're helping to raise the bar in terms of the standards of Down syndrome health, I think that'd be a wonderful side effect. That's not what we started out to do, but if that's what's happening, uh, I'm grateful to my team uh, for that to uh, have happened. And there's some 
some of the references that uh, we used. <clears throat> 